Hello, everyone. Let everyone get in here. I'll let them in. I got them. Perfect. Great. Hello, everyone, and thank you for all for being here um, and joining us for our alumni career conversation series. Um, these sessions have been getting very positive reviews. Um, it's a great way to keep us connected, informed about how the industry is responding to challenge and change, um, as well as certainly how those challenges and changes are affecting the job market. Um, throughout our time, please feel free to enter any questions that you have in the chat box as you think of them. Um, we will certainly open the conversation for direct questions, obviously time permitting toward the end of the session. Um, we do ask that you keep yourself muted until we get to that direct question portion um, of our time. And now I will turn the conversation over to Dean Michael Speaks, who will introduce our guest and be facilitating our session today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kristen. I'm sorry, I'm still letting people in. I'm, I'm full service tonight. Um, so uh, uh, great to have, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kristen. And um, thank you all for joining another one of these events. Or, or there really have been conversations. Um, uh, tonight, we have a great speaker and a great friend of our school and also uh, an alum of our school. I was speaking with her briefly before and told her that um, we have, I think we've done maybe 10 or 12 or 15 of these now. And we very often do these with two people. But um, our speaker tonight has so many job titles that she's almost like three or four people already. And she does so many things and so well um, that I just wanna start by thanking her for taking a little time out of her day today to come and, and have a conversation with us tonight. Um, so our speaker tonight is, uh, is Rosa Shang. Uh, she's a 1994 graduate of our school. Uh, I'm going to go down my list and read her many, her many titles. They are all, I mean, many people have titles that are meaningless. Uh, all of her titles are even more meaningful than, than, than they seem, and they're quite uh, Im impressive as, as they are. Um, she is FAIA. That's an interesting story in and of itself. Um, I was just listening, among other things, Rosa... Uh, gave our convocation address, I believe, in 2018, and she talked about about um, her FAIA um, membership and joining the uh, joining the fellows, and and what an interesting um, time that was, and also a life lesson um, uh, for us all. So uh, she's principal at Smith Group San Francisco. Uh, she is also director of uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion at Smith Group uh, in San Francisco. Uh, she's, uh, in addition to that, a practicing architect and has done many great projects, including some that you very likely have been inside and purchased something inside of, which, it, which are the Apple stores. Uh, she worked on uh, a number of those, but, but in particular, the one in New York City. I believe you worked on the one in New York City, uh, but she worked on, on the glass facades and on many aspects of those projects. Um, uh, and what is, uh, I say all that to say that she's, she is, in addition to being principal at Smith Group, director of uh, JEDI at Smith Group, uh, she's also the higher education studio leader um, at Smith Group. Um, and as if she needed other things to do, she's also the founding chair of Equity by Design, which is a national movement created by the AIA San Francisco uh, chapter to advocate for equitable practices in pay and architecture. And she's been, I think that's about maybe four or five or six years old now. And they have been doing um, a pretty remarkable set of surveys every year. And I, I guess you all continue to do that. I'm gonna stop there and just say, uh, welcome Rosa. I don't know if you have any opening things to say, but, we, but typically with these conversations, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we're all very curious about your time here uh, at the school, which was uh, 1994. You graduated into a recession. 
I did. And, um, <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll start. We'll start there. <laughs> Take it away. The time warp continuum, right? Of uh -huh. where we are today and where we were in 1994. And so um, coming out of school, there was a lot of uncertainty and uh, the North Arrow for me in, in kind of guidance in navigating that was uh, you know, just to be resilient in, in trying anything. And I, I think I took literally the first job that accepted me because everybody was so fearful of being able to get a job. I didn't even think, or I wasn't able to be picky if you will you know, to get the best job, it was get a job, get a job, get a job, start there. As my father has this uh, very uh, deeply in, in uh, Chinese uh, philosophy of you, you get, or there's a, there's a saying about, and Chinese New Year being very apropos, um, never, it's harder to get on a running horse from the ground than it is to get on a horse from another horse. So obviously getting on that first horse is very difficult. And so catapulted into that with the support of um, my parents. But then from that, in the first, I would say three years of my career, I had four different jobs. And so that might be also seen as like, mm, you don't wanna do that. Uh, but at that point, there was a dissatisfaction continuously of the vision of what I was supposed to be doing from graduating from school and everything that was taught to me, i.e. become the best um, designer, you know, architect that you can be by the models of the people that were taught to me in school. But then the reality, the harsh reality of the economy and also just practical uh, experience gaining, there was a disconnect. And at that point I was like, mm, I don't know, did I study all this to do bathroom and toilet, you know, details and elevator details? and to be at the low end or you know, just to do renderings and not really get into the, the meat of what we learned in school. And asking those questions and challenging you know, this kind of reality distortion led me to the career that I have now by continuing to challenge, is that enough? Um, am I doing what, I'm, what I set out to do? Um, doubting the entire way, but having champions that always said, you know, don't quit there's so much about this profession yet to be explored or you know, captured in what you trained for. So I hope that's a good starting point. It is a good starting point. Conversation of resilience. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll ask you, um, you know, what, your, what your time was like at Syracuse in 94. Was, how big was the school? What was it like to be here? Um, and do you, did, did you feel like the five-year professional degree prepared you to be uh, to, to enter the job market and yeah, what was what, what was it like to be here at that time? Absolutely, we are in the critical transition point between um, Werner Seligman and Bruce Abbey's uh, deanships. So Werner Seligman, as you know, uh, set the reputation of the school. It was hyper rigorous of the Ecole de Beaux Arts, you know, foundation Le, Le Corbusier, heavy into the uh, technical aspects of you know the modern design, and then Bruce Abbey having slightly you know, aligned but slightly different take, I think, we were able to benefit from the transition of both, you know, uh, philosophies of rigor, but also an openness to the future and what that brought. And, but um, our class was actually unique in that it was the largest class ever accepted at the time when we got in, I think it was like 125 plus or minus. And then there's a historical attrition rate where you know it's supposed to be halved or whatever it was, we def defied that uh, statistic by graduate. I think we had 94 graduates from that class, so we were one of the largest graduate classes I think of that time as well. Wow. And then compounded with the recession, you know, and, and the job market, it was interesting to see. We do a lot of us do keep in touch still, um, and we're fortunate to have that cohort. So it's been interesting to see who has continued on. With the traditional uh, uh, roles and responsibilities in a traditional firm, and then who have kind of um, gone off the various different beaten paths, if you will, uh, to various careers that uh, were just as you know legitimate as ours. And I think that's a good conversation as well. Like we're trained to do anything, I think, um, whether it's a traditional career or an exploration outside of that career choice original career choice. 
I'm going to ask you a, a little bit about, uh, and I, I was sort of joking, but not really about your titles. You really do wear, you wear many hats and you, you are a thought leader. You speak many places. You're, you're very influential, especially, um, I mean, in fact, the, the very first time I heard them, I heard about Jedi was in conversation with you. Of course, we're, we like many schools, like, like the industry is, uh, deeply involved in addressing, uh, you know, a lack of attention for many years in diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. But, but, but you, 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 in, in a couple of conversations we had over the last year or two, um, introduced uh, the Jedi, which is, in, it, in, which is the introduction of, of justice to, to that equation. Um, what does a director of J uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion do at Smith Group and how big is Smith Group and what what is Smith Group? I, I, I know what it is, sure. but it's a big firm. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with Jedi first. So back in 2017 at um, AIA National Convention, where I had the fortune of uh, being the facilitator for a conversation with with uh, Francis Carre, Alejandro Aravina, um, Mass Design Group, Michael Murphy, and Sophia Borges, who was part of um, a design firm in LA uh, designing homeless shelters that were, you know, were dignified. That group was kind of the, um, for me, the DNA of what Jedi architecture represented, but nobody had uh, coined the term at that time. And for me, justice and equity must exist before we have uh, to realize diverse and inclusive outcomes because diversity and inclusion have been around for quite some time in the desired goal of equal representation, but without recognizing the historical policies and practices, uh, namely in racism, but also in you know, gender inequities that have plagued our country. And they've only kind of exploded last year in their awakening. Uh, but we were talking about it back in 2017 as you know, what are the structural issues that continue to per perpetuate the lack of representation, not only in architecture, but every major field you know, uh, medicine and, um, you know, uh, CEO leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that it really took off because I think also the alliteration of Star Wars and this larger idea of, you know, good versus evil, right? So people uh, had trouble remembering the acronym of D, you know, EDI, which was equity, diversity, inclusion, equity being recognizing and identifying the barriers to success in order to mitigate them, but justice being the recognition of those historic practices and policies, the systemic, right? Not just the individual treatment of people or the biases or the belief systems, but how do those belief systems in actions of policies that hinder people in mass quantities create, you know, uh, less out, you know, less um, desirable outcomes financially, and also in determinants of health outcomes and uh, life expectancy, you know, these are big issues, right? And so how, do, and how does architecture actually play its part in that bigger conversation? So, uh, you know, a, a kind of a wormhole of a, of a conversation, but we start with Jedi as a way for people to get to the table, right? With this basic premise, like it's not just enough to want people who are of diverse backgrounds at the table, but to understand the why behind why we don't have it. And mm -hmm the fact that we can't even realize uh, the other things without addressing that issue. So people ask about climate crisis and why we can't solve climate crisis yet. And we can't do that because you know, racism is actually part of the problem um, in that we can't you know, get to um, solving health issues and health outcomes and those life expectancy disparities unless we face the crux of racism in our country, right? The historical and, 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 and these are very distinctly, specifically issues that are relevant in architecture, not only in the profession and in schools, but you and I were also discuss, uh, speaking earlier just about the alignment, for example, of redlining and the way in which the other, um, let's say virus and health crisis that has befallen us um, in the last year, COVID-19, how those align and you can 
see, for example, in, in historical practices of redlining, um, it, it, it overlays very um, cleanly, yes. <laughs> unfortunately, efficiently with, um, uh, with, with, with the most, uh, let's say, well, with, with some of the most uh, powerful effects of COVID-19 on populations now. Yes, there's very startling. We've done in our workshops with Equity by Design these uh, side by sides, if you will, of very recent reports about COVID cases and the concentrations in this mapping data, uh, you know, infographic world we live in. And then if you superimpose that next to the historic redlining maps from the color of law per se, you can almost overlap them and see and circle the areas of redlining where the uh, sacrificial zones as coined by Hop Hopkins in terms of land of waste or disposable land, but also disposable people and the, the explosion of COVID, if you will, in who is hardest hit and who is actually dying from COVID uh, is related to those redlining maps. And it's, you know, it's just amazing how that type of mindset and policy of the haves and have nots has played itself out in life and who gets to live and who, who ends up dying. So Was sorry, how, big thoughts. <laughs> uh, um, um, how, how within, let's say, how within Smith Group does your position uh, manifest itself. I mean, like, what do you do as a director of, uh, of of Jedi within Smith Group? Is it is it specifically within Smith Group? Do you? I know you're a you're a thought leader and a speaker. You 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 talk about this more broadly as well. But within within your company, how have you all addressed this and 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 these issues? And how how does that work in a in a big office like that? Absolutely. So I was hired in 2017 um, to become at that point the director of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, I was advocating for justice, but they weren't ready for it at that time because again, there wasn't this explosion of realization that we needed it and that sense of urgency. They knew it was a good thing to do, but it wasn't, they thought it was more of a policy thing and you know, we are architects and engineers, et cetera. Uh, but I accepted the position with the challenge that we had end up adding the J later. Right, and that was kind of part of the negotiation process. And the when was yet the determinant, but I was hired as a thought leader to question um, the systems that were currently in place. They already had uh, the DNA of an integrated design practice, uh, but the why wasn't exactly coherent to the power, the value proposition of integration and what we're calling intersectional relationships. Um, the integration of engineering, architecture, planning, sustainability, and social justice were part of the mantra of Smith Group. So it's a design practice of 1,200 people at this point in over 16 offices across the US. So integrated design means not just architecture, but we have a lot of cross-disciplinary uh, practitioners within the organization. The goal of which is to practice in this integrated way where we connect the dots. It's not just about the physical environment, but it's also about the sustainable environment. It's also about the health outcomes. And the more dots we connect in our design process of the built environment together, the stronger the design and the uh, impacts of that design will be on any particular community. So right. the justice part is a very important part that was missing at the time of the why we do things. And now with uh, the things that happened in 2020, there's been a doubling down of the commitment to uh, spearhead the issues that plague us in terms of design justice or lack thereof. So we had a statement last year shortly after George Floyd was murdered and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery in saying enough was enough and that um, we, you know, acknowledging our culpability and ignoring of uh, the historic racism that existed and committing to anti-racism, which is a, a practice of daily unearthing of racism in our systems and calling it out and addressing them. And quite immediately, in addition to creating a Jedi committee that deals with more of the tactical things that need to be done, there was a commitment by the senior leadership 
the board in terms of mandating immediately of uh, not, we had not designed um, places of mass incarceration, but a, declare, a declaration of that, that it was wrong and a commitment to seriously evaluating the spectrum of, you know, uh, police stations and civic centers, right, and public safety related to holding cells and states of incarceration all the way up to the worst act, right? And that was a very deep commitment by a large firm because a lot of large firms actually engage in detention centers and places of incarceration um, because of the economic uh, demand of it in their, uh, in their business model. We chose not to engage in that for quite some time, I think the last 10 to 15 years, but strategically saying, no, this is wrong. This is the reason why this is wrong is something new as of last year. And then on top of that, there's a whole infrastructure framework taking place in evaluating what are we not doing enough of and being frank and candid and vulnerable about it and, and holding each other accountable to it is the difference at this point in the organization. So it's quite an exciting time within the organization. It's a difficult conversation, it continues to be, but part of the learnings of anti-racism by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi is this kind of daily acknowledgement that we can all do better. So it's been, yeah, a good time. And Rosa, does that, has, has that uh, work been occurring through, throughout Smith Group? I mean, do you, um, I'm just curious, like how, how, because, because in a sense, it's, it's both an educational agenda and platform, but it's one that, uh, that assumes that a certain kind of enlightenment about, enlightenment about these issues will lead to other kinds of actions. How does, how does that get manifest in a big firm like, like, uh, Smith Group? It's, uh, it's a, or is it a work in progress? <laughs> it's a work in progress and we acknowledge that, right? <laughs> uh, but I think at the various levels of leadership, it's a three-pronged approach if we try to break it down, break down the, uh, the giant elephant, if you will. So we've got the representation part or the lack thereof as one category and um, a meaningful career, if you will, for those uh, trying to increase the representation within the practice itself as one kind of core goal. And that requires looking at historic policies and practices about hiring and retention and promotion and salary bonus and doing basically an assessment, a third party assessment, right? Of all those policies and practices. We started with um, leadership groups adopting new policies for promotion to associate this past year and we did see the results of that play out in who got nominated. You could actually self-nominate this past year and who actually got promoted into associateship was quite different from years before the, the policy of you know, equitable frameworks were adopted. That's one example. But then mm -hmm. the second part is how do we um, change the way we practice so that we are you know, uh, looking for uh, in each of the major areas that we do practice, higher education being where I am, but healthcare, uh, urban environments, housing, and uh, workplace being the major areas, but then we also do work in, um, in cultural areas such as museums and historical you know, places, art, etc. cetera. Um, how do we have impact where we listen to the community who has historically been ignored or silenced and how do we incorporate those goals into the design? And it's not just the person that has the commission that gives us the commission as the uh, influencer of the design, right? And those are bigger questions of engagement, whether it's student engagement in higher ed, whether it's um, community engagement in housing and urban realm, whether it's patient engagement, you know, so beyond doctors and the administrators, what's missing from the current designs, what's keeping, what are the barriers that are keeping people from access, who belongs within a space or perceived to be belonging, who is perceived to be an encumbrance or an endangerment because of the way spaces are designed, right? Those are big right. questions. But fundamentally, each group is tasked with this design justice lens 
to ask those questions and then also change the processes by which we engage with clients in the design um, approach from conceptual all the way to the actual built product. And so that in itself is the, the second part of the wheel. The third part of the wheel is that in the design outcomes it, themselves, once we build it, how are they maintained and how do they actually impact a change in behavior or philosophy of the current issues that we're facing, whether it's health disparities, whether it's social injustice, whether it's environmental crisis. So again, very big picture, but those three yes. buckets influence each other. Very helpful. Your director of, uh, your, your, rather your higher ed studio leader, um, what does that mean at a, at a big company <laughs> like Smith Group? Um, I know, I mean, I know that that names um, a typology and a profile or let's say a piece of the portfolio of projects that Smith Group works on. Um, but what is in practical terms, what does that, what does that mean? What, what do you do? <laughs> what do I do all day? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know Not, I, no, you do I many know. things all day. <laughs> It's like the kids book, um, <laughs> Richard Scary books. And so it's yes. a great question. Um, it's, again, it's multi-pronged, but I'll start with the idea that uh, the most, one of the most underserved populations or clients, if you will, I believe are students. Students are one of the most vulnerable populations at a very nascent point of formation into, you know, independence, adulthood, um, being able to, fly, if you will, but not having the quite all the mechanisms to do so, and then being simultaneously put under duress, financial debt in incurring that education and that gateway to the next, you know, to freedom and all the possibilities of success. Um, and also um, the rigor and the challenges of being away from family, the emotional mental health issues uh, that are put by being away from your core network of supporters, right? So imagine you've been supported for the first 18 years of your life that you can do things by this family and friend network. And all of a sudden you're pulled out of that into this foreign environment to be challenged without it. And uh, so on top of basic needs, we have championed um, what we call an ecosystem of student development. So mental health, uh, sense of belonging, physical health, uh, the, um, access to agency and a sense of purpose, right? All those things are the ingredients to student persistence, what we're calling student persistence and space matters. And we use architecture school as kind of the, um, the ideal scenario where we are able to create a cohort group because we had the studio environment. We take for granted the studio environment that most I think of our other counterparts don't have in higher education, right? They go to classes, they go to their dorms, and that's it. And if they're lucky, they're part of a club or a sorority or fraternity to create that uh, essential network of mentors and, and champions that support you in those tough times of getting through all that you need to get through to graduate, right? And anyway, so I think that's what draw me to higher education. And so we, do work not only in your traditional, you know, uh, four-year colleges, but we also champion community colleges because that's the bridge or the gateway and affordability to uh, those that are historically disenfranchised that can break through, if you will, to get to uh, future possibilities and social mobility. Well, so do, do you see the 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 twinning of the the let's say the recognition and the and, and the reckoning with uh, with racial injustice and uh, and COVID, um, how how are those two things wound together now affecting edu the education practice and ed and design of spaces in the education typology? I, I would imagine there's an enormous amount of thinking going on about how. Uh, we we just finished them. Um, uh, just opened this past week a new um, the Shine Student Center, and uh, it was of course reimagined and, and redesigned before COVID. And I, I, I just in walking through it and thinking about it, I see so many things 
that actually were not rethought or were not thought through because, you know, because it was prior to COVID. And some things that actually serendipitously turned out to be great solutions to problems that didn't exist um, at the time. I'm just wondering, you know, as a firm, um, how you all are thinking about these challenges in space, uh, designing space and designing buildings in the education sector, given that both these uh, issues are coming to bear probably on schools and universities and high schools and middle schools probably is more strongly there and more directly there than almost anywhere else. Absolutely. Um, I think we are fortunate in that we are already champions of looking at space resources before COVID hit. And I think they're even more critical now. Um, we know historically, if you walk through the hallowed halls of various universities that are esteemed, that there's a lot of empty hallway space with no furniture in it, and you're supposed to, you know, quickly traverse through, but there's no place to hang out per se. There's no place to check uh, your email or to prepare before or after your class to ask questions of uh, instructors or professors if you didn't get something and you know you need a little more support. Um, that is missing, right? And it even compounds it when we're in COVID and we're virtual that we, again, we took for granted that seeing people and creating these trusted relationships and the sense of belonging somewhere and the sense of people caring about each other and caring that we matter um, is highlighted. So I think uh, in the temporary state, there's definitely provisions of getting access to uh, the hands-on type things that people need, whether it's outdoor gathering, you know, temporary, you know, creative ways to get around what we're missing right now. But right. I think it has raised an awareness with administrators and what students are bringing up as important to them, that when we do go back post vaccination, that there is more emphasis on space for students and that cohort building support making uh, that they're there, if you will, right? That all the money being spent in the past has not always been for that student support, namely right. not in architecture school, but in uh, the general sense of where did it go? You know, there's this double thinking of faculty offices and it's not to say that faculty don't deserve to have offices, but is it an exclusive right of real estate to be had or can it be creatively rethought where there is lockable storage of some sort for the faculty, but that office could be repurposed as a study room or a, a group project room in the evenings, right? So we've, we've challenged that right. idea of the sacred white tower, if you will, for lack of a better term, in saying space being more critical of a real estate, aging infrastructure and the cost of providing new architecture, new infrastructure, um, almost being unapproachable at some point in time in the future because of rev lost revenue. How do we creatively repurpose spaces uh, to serve to better serve um, what was missing before? If that makes any right. sense. Right, right. How how you know you, we, we were we have we were discussing also a little bit um, some workshops that you've been doing with students uh, at, at conferences yes. and. I'm wondering because I mean many of us are familiar with the kind of um, public uh, fora and and vehicles that are used for public input and for for university projects. Let's say for like a like a student center or even dorms or or any any campus project. Yeah, you know we facilitate meetings with students and ask questions. It's how 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 <laughs> How is what you all are doing different from that? And and because because I know you were, we were talking recently about about some of these workshops you're doing as a as a very different kind of mechanism and vehicle for empathizing with students, understanding needs, and 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 bringing that into the con design conversation from the outset. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to I'm trying to log in, but there's this program called Mural. Uh, co that is of uh, the 
virtual whiteboard where we used to have meetings in person and we did our engagement with uh, design thinking exercises, posted exercises, if you will. And that was part of the engagement process, the actual writing down, the looking, the listening, the feedback loop, the breakouts, but then the coming together of those uh, user groups, et cetera. We're doing that all virtually now. And if you're okay with me sharing my screen, I can give you an example of sure. Let me let me doing. enable that. Uh, I'm okay. doing that right now. You should be able should to be do all it. set. I, yes. Oh, great. Okay, so one second. So I'll, I'll keep talking while I'm um, multitasking here. Yes, we all have to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, this has been a breakthrough this year, and I think more people will be adopting or engaging it. And uh, what this tool allows you to do is not only uh, work in the space, work in this virtual space at the same time, i.e. you could do uh, design charrettes where you end up pinning up on a you know, shared board, um, but you can also elicit feedback and, and critique and comments. And you can walk away from it and people can go into it. At, you can have a kickoff meeting, but then uh, have interim space you know, during the week where people fall in and out of the, the, the board. And then you could have a culmination meeting at the end of the week. So the way we've um, created engagement throughout a design process, this is a STEAM uh, building for a community college where there is the first of its kind the traditional 2D and 3D arts integration with uh, traditional chemistry, biology, and um, some uh, biotech labs in the same space of a building. And so a lot of different stakeholders of diverse backgrounds, how do you get them all to the same page? Uh, we use this uh, vehicle as a way to get everybody to understand the design process in a very open, transparent way of how we create design from the inception of key strategic goals to how do we determine what's important of design criteria to the broader user community, of some historical information about the project site itself. And then as we des developed the design um, options, there was a consistency of uh, the way that the information was portrayed in terms of not only the program and how it laid out in the building massing, but uh, links to videos where people could do the fly through and the walk through. But most importantly, um, analysis about each design proposition with a key criteria element that they thought was very important. So we uh, had this kind of cross section of criteria with each design scheme. And then from that, we had a feedback loop with Poll Everywhere where people got to vote on the various mm. uh, design schemes in terms of the design criteria. So it wasn't, I liked this scheme the best because it looked great, but these schemes prevailed in terms of how they addressed campus presence, campus edge, uh, you know, usable outdoor space, and even what we've dubbed as student space resources I just got done talking about, right? And the building heart, the there, there, uh, the DNA of uh, what it meant to be part of a particular building. And so we took the feedback that they gave us from the survey and we literally planted it here and read through them at the meeting to say, you know, we not only heard you of what you said, but we have it collected here so that everybody can see why a particular design rose to the top by this uh, engaged methodology, if you will, of a rubric and a very rigorous framework of design critique and selection, and less about uh, authorities or positions of historical power and those people being the influencers of what rose to the top, if that makes any sense. Right. So it's and, democratizing and, and, design. Well, and, and it also is making it uh, more transparent. Right and, and it's a recoverable process in a shared governance model where many community colleges demand that it is a shared governance model where all the stakeholders, faculty, administrators, and even students are part of the decision-making process. It's seen as a horror or a nightmare 
to a you know design professional historically because nobody had the means to be able to do all this in real time but the technology actually has enabled a democratization of the process if that makes any sense and rosa is this an iterative process do you it's does this an yeah. iterative process so this is one of many boards this capture is uh two meetings the presentation part of the meeting which is the top of the board and then the feedback loop of what we presented so they had like uh three or four days to look at the design iterations to go into the board to zoom in close to look at each of the things and then they got to vote on it and then we had a second meeting at the culmination of the week to reveal the you know the voting outcomes and the why behind the voting outcomes so that we had buy-in that way and consensus building from that right. process so i hope right. that's a good short answer to the long question no 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 it's a it's a it's a it's a great answer and if you've if you've ever been on juries or or pitched to juries before selection committees before you will know this is a very different kind of process than 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 that one it yeah. is it is um maybe you could say uh and and people should uh, if, if if anyone has questions just type them in and I'll I'll pick them up and, yeah. and address them along the way, and we'll we'll have a period shortly where where you can just uh, address Rosa directly. But just a couple more things I want to I want to maybe ask you about. One is um are the workshops that you were doing with students um, recently, and uh, because those workshops were dealing with very specific needs that students had that and match those up with um with let's say with designers and 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 a lot of kind of enlightening things occurred that the designers oh, yes. were unaware of yeah yes so at Could the AC talk? yeah at the acsa conference so association of collegiate right. schools of architecture the deans met in on the west coast two years ago and we did an in-person workshop at that point with profiles of potential architecture students and it was kind of like a fortune cookie approach where we identified uh, the person by, not by name, but by identity description. So race and ethnicity, um, gender spectrum, um, where they grew up, uh, what their family situation was, where they currently were housed, what kind of employment, if they had any, and their mobility range and some other belief systems. And so that created a persona uh, we had an, uh, and they're intentionally intersectional, forcing people to think outside a monolith of what a particular person could or, or should be. And so we gave those fortune cookie slips, if you will, to faculty members, and we asked them to become that persona, to read, digest, and even though it might seem completely foreign to them, um, what would it be like to be that persona in, as an architecture student going through the current curriculum as it stands today with the potential challenges that were outlined. And it was a pretty uh, amazing empathy building exercise in the questions we asked, like what would the barriers be on a daily basis for this particular student, whether it was you know, mobility or access or the fact that they worked two jobs and then had to complete a studio session you know, in a review, et cetera or um, you know, uh, prevention of having childcare resources for the single parent, right? Or you know, all these different scenarios right. that one had to consider that nobody ever really thought of because typically we come from a more uh, traditional pathway. So they're forcing the atraditional identities and the empathy for them in, in, in an architectural school context, right? So, Right. I thought that was a, a great beginning. I think we need to do more of that empathy building. I think students can also do that empathy building in terms of design personas, the potential clients, right? Not everybody is going mm -hmm. to fit into a, a vanilla, uh, you know, idea envelope of a client uh, persona of a, a rich person with all the money in the world or something, um, but that you're actually designing for uh, a spectrum of users and uh, increasing number of challenges that many people have, not only today in the co post COVID world, but will have, you know, well into the future. So we, 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 usually, uh, we usually go for about an hour or a little longer because we don't like to keep our guests because they, uh, 
but so 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 I, I'm going to transition, and I don't think it's a hard transition, but transition maybe a little bit to the to because we have a lot of students here tonight who are either currently on the job market, will be on the job market, and are thinking about, um, int or or maybe they're thinking about internships. Uh, maybe a couple of general questions for Smith Group and for your colleagues. What is the world looking like right now? I assume you all are working probably online mostly, but what is the, what is the immediate job situation look like, uh, short, medium, long term? Um, what kind of trends are there out there? And also, is there, and this is going to sound like a, this is going to be a, a, a very naive question, but I think it's a meaningful one. Um, how, how do you determine um, what kind of office you will want to go and work for in terms of its receptivity to Jedi issues and in terms of is there, there's not a ranking system, although there probably should be, or maybe there is one on the horizon. Are there, how, how, how does one go about thinking about that? There's various unofficial metrics, right? I've yeah. heard that people surf websites um, to see what the leadership demographic looks like. And even if they might have Jedi, you know, strewn across their launch website, um, if they look at the uh, the DNA of the leadership and they they see a disconnect, then they're less apt to believe or trust what is being said, you know, on the website, right? Right. And so we try very hard. Uh, we have tried very hard in the last uh, three years to practice what we preach, in in terms of recognizing that there is a lack of diverse leadership, but also working actively to change that. And, and so it's a double prong thing. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have picked Smith Group, you know, to be quite honest, from that first glance as well. Um, but yet I was willing to go a little bit further. So I would offer that as advice. Uh, you know, be a little suspicious. It's good to be suspicious, but also dig a little deeper. Um, see it on your LinkedIn connections, if you have friends that have worked for a particular firm, you know, get that direct feedback uh, from people that you trust in, in terms of understanding if a firm is going in the right direction, um, being authentic to, we haven't gotten it right in the past, but we're working intentionally and earnestly to help. And I think there's a huge benefit now for um, not only people from diverse backgrounds, but people that believe in um, the Jedi mindset to be very attractive to firms that are trying to change uh, the way they do business. And you know, I think that is a strength in how we practice today and also that intersection that I talked about. It's not just a sustainable practitioner anymore. It's not just a, somebody who does high rises. You, know, you really have to have a deep wheelhouse of knowledge and or interest in obtaining that knowledge. You don't have to be an expert at everything, but it's more of the Renaissance concept mm -hmm. that you need mm -hmm. to know a little bit more of everything. And I, I think that Syracuse does provide that kind of uh, foundation or platform. So I think you're off to a good start in that wide breadth of knowledge, even though the depth will be, you know, oftentimes a little shallower than one wants, but you can build that depth over time in your practice. Maybe uh, uh, Sofia Gutierrez, uh, who's one of our officers in our NOMAS chapter, has a question here, I guess kind of directly maybe related to what you were suggesting about authenticity. Um, you know, what really are the features of authenticity? She, she's asking, how do we diversify offices without tokenizing BIPOC architects? That is one of our questions that we face every day. <laughs> um, very good question. And it starts with the rubric that I mentioned in terms of hiring, um, promotion, and um, advancement practices uh, in terms of salary and uh, bonuses. In that when we hire, we try to, to do a blind process of uh, not looking at the names of the resumes first, but looking at the qualifications and asking consistent questions when we do have a pool for interview. and so 
being consistent about adopting the rubric where all the reviewers of the potential candidates are looking at the qualifications across the board and consistently. And even in the, in, we went through the bonus and salary review in the last two months, we put on the same hat, if you will. Uh, we created a rubric that was based on not on favoritism or who we knew, but on qualifications, whether past accomplishments or future potential, it was consistent throughout the board. And when people tried to veer off, we could tell that there was this um, tendency towards old ways of you know, being champions of the people we work with directly, trying to advocate for them, which is a natural inclination to a, nope, we, we agreed to create this rubric of an equitable mindset in terms of who we promote because of qualifications, because of abilities, because of potential. And it's always rated the same way if that's as a starting mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there is a need to recognize. It's not to say where the, I think the worst thing that could happen is to say, well, we, we don't uh, we erase race because you know you've heard the wrong term colorblind. There is no colorblind because uh, in the Senate when the insurrection was happening, a senator misspoke by saying, "Well, why don't we go over to the Republican side because we can blend in," only to realize that his uh, constituent, his counterparts, senators and Congress people of color could not blend in. So there is no blending in concept of uh, how we get to a more diverse um, set of promotion practices, et cetera. We cannot ignore the past injustices. And so um, while we're not promoting people because of the color of their skin, we have to look hard at why they're currently not in the positions of power and ask ourselves what opportunities there are for people that have, you know, for whatever reason, not been looked at in a leadership position in the past, question it like, well, they've been here, you know, 10 years, why aren't they in a position of leadership and to grant those opportunities as well. You know, so it's a, it's a double-sided thing. At the same time, we're trying to create these rubrics of equity. We also need to look at the his, historic injustices of what has prevented people from being promoted in the past, whether they are licensed and other people weren't licensed, you know, those nuances or whether they worked on these high profile projects or whether they were quiet or you know, not quiet, all those things play into uh, advancing people of color and into these positions. I hope that is a starting point. It's not an easy question to uh, great, answer. Great, great question, Sophia. Um, uh, Rosa, so maybe in, a, in purely practical terms, what what does the job, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations with a lot of leaders and, and many firms, a lot of principals, big firms, small firms, medium sized firms. Um, mostly uh, we have been hearing a pretty positive uh, appraisal of what we can expect in the kind of medium and longer term that, that firms are returning, uh, they're, they're hiring again, uh, internships are, are back on the table um what is your what is your sense of that in in, in you know at, at your firm and, and 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 speaking with colleagues what's can we can we be um can we be somewhat um optimistic about what we see on the horizon i believe so i think that even though we are still in the throes of recovery um economically and um health wise that the solution is to uh to challenge the status quo and to say, well, what have we not been doing? What are we missing? And how do we create value for our clients? We're asking that question every day in our pursuits. How do we differentiate ourselves um, to create more value? And it's usually looking at problems that need to be solved. Ultimately, architects are problem solvers. Um, and instead of saying, well, I'm gonna follow the old rules of what's valued, I'm going to look at it differently and I'm going to go to the places that aren't being served and find the potential there, right? And so there's a lot of work in social justice, design justice work for communities. That's a huge underserved population. 
Um, there's a lot of work in healthcare and revamping the healthcare systems that are obviously broken with access to who gets care and who doesn't, right? And uh, housing, right? There's so many different places of opportunity. We are starting a group. We have um, some housing disciplines, uh, senior living, multifamily, and we dabble in student housing, but we're getting more vested into student housing. And we're challenging those traditional um, sectors, if you will, to say, there's the future of housing and it doesn't look like what has been proposed in the past. And so how do we crack the nut of affordable um, various uh, demographics of those being housed? So even using terms like multifamily is very biased towards what is a nuclear family and who is historically viewed as a family, right? Versus multi-tenant or multi-occupant uh, housing, right? And could there be hybrids between seniors that live on campuses with students? Could there be hybrids of families that go to school with, uh, you know, in, in concert with the student, right? So that they're living off campus, but they're providing, they're still, the student is still able to support their family. The family is still able to support the student. There is an example of that in Canada with um, mm. indigenous tribes and in terms of not re having the student being out there all alone, but they're able to support, you know, the family that was financially dependent on them, but also the, the family is there to provide the emotional and mental support. Um, so again, brainstorming, see, looking for the problems and then targeting them and using our creativity to come up with the solutions and opportunities. That's where our potential lies. In, in creating so, value. so, so, but you, but you, but, but to be clear, you, you, you see real opportunity in these areas for job growth um, in, in small, medium, large, extra large firms. And, and we'll, we'll start to see more jobs in those areas going forward. Pro, what practical advice? Uh, so, so that's how firms differentiate themselves one from the other. They're adding new value by reassessing kind of social conditions and seeing what kinds of populations have been underserved or not served very well. Um, how, how do, what practical advice might you give students for differentiating themselves in the marketplace and approaching the marketplace as we kind of begin to ease back into this world where people are gonna to start to hire again, both for internships and jobs? A uh, great question and very timely because I just, uh, this morning I helped, uh, I'm a member uh, on the board of a uh, design justice practice called Colocate Design out of New Orleans. And Brian Lee is uh, the founder of that. I was helping him interview. And um, in terms of what we are trying to look for in the applicants for the positions that he has available, it was less about this, the direct uh, tactical skills that they had coming in, which are important, but it was more about how they approached uh, the mindset of the practice that was trying to align with, uh, try to find, trying to find alignment of the practices, values, and strategic goals with the person, right? And so what we're, the questions we were asking were a little different to start with in terms of how do you go, what do you think about design justice in, in the case of this particular firm? And how have you been exposed to it? And, and what types of thinking have uh, forced you to, you know, practice it or to basically grow out of, you know, what was typically taught in school, right? And so uh, you can teach skill sets. You could teach how to produce a CD set. You could teach going to the construction site and handling RFIs, you know, qu requests for information and submittals, etc. You can't. It's harder to teach. Uh, purpose and passion in a mindset. So if somebody were to ask you, what's your passion in the profession? Like, why do you get up and do this every day? Uh, it's good to have a good understanding of your own reason of why you do things. What, what wakes you up in the morning to come into this profession every day? And it's not all gonna be the same. There is no canned answer. It is really what drives you. So there was a spectrum in the people we interviewed of what drove them. And it was night and day difference between the candidates, but 
equally as intriguing in terms of their thought process. How do they think? How do they go about solving problems? And even if they haven't been exposed to design justice, how did they do uh, extracurricular research or volunteer projects to help them get exposed to things that they wanted to do in the profession? Hope that helps. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to see if because we're 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 we've moved past the hour and I don't want to keep you too too much longer, but I want to um, invite uh, any of those who are on the zoom to please if they have questions, then you can unmic yourself and ask those or you can type them in and we'll ask them for you. Um, yeah, I'm wondering. Are there are there any questions, any observations, like, like, uh, maybe somebody might ask, well, hey, Rosa, do you have a job for me? Um, probably, maybe someone will ask a question. I, I would, if I would want, like tonight, I would want to go and work for Rosa. I'm gonna, my question right now is, Rosa, how, how do I come to work for Smith, <laughs> Smith Group? How do I come to work for an enlightened company like yours? What, 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 what do I do practically? Yes. Um, start by reaching out. I'm probably going to get an inundated um, email box, but that's okay. And it's it starts with connections, right? So you might not get the job day one, but persistence is key and timing is important too. Um, we are constantly looking for a potential fit as we grow the studio, right? And uh, all our studios are growing, albeit slow, more slowly now than in previous years. But uh, where other firms may be uh, constricting, we are constricting. We constricted slightly last year, but we're still in a growth mindset mode. Mm -hmm. And so, start by reaching out, um, ask, asking questions of not only what you could be doing but also areas of interest that you that you want to explore right so at the at the core of it the successful people are the ones that are resilient and persistent right and have a clear sense of what they want to do it's not to say that if you're still exploring what you want to do that you'll be behind but it's a continuation of a journey to have a good sense of where you want to be and what you want to do. And again, you don't have to know the answer today, but you have to start exploring it. And the quicker you start the exploration process, you could say, I, I commit myself to six months or you know, a year to really trying to figure out what I want to do with this uh, career, or this profession. And in that exploration mode, you're going to find out so many things, not only about yourself, in, in terms of who you are, um, but what you really want to do, because you could be safe and say, I just want a job. Um, this is much more than a job, right? We're not here to provide right. just a job. Um, right. We're really here to push the limits of what architecture can and should be doing. And we want people that are willing to go there with us um, in terms of that journey. Does that make so, sense? So, um, so, I will take your. I would take your answer to be, uh, Michael. Please send me an email, and I, uh, I, I might, um, I might offer you some advice. And are you all, are, are you all hiring for, um, for internships for this summer and for next year? Is, is are internships back? Is possibilities now? Are back. I have to check the timing because it's slightly different in every yeah. office. Yeah. I think right. we do are opening that up as we speak. So let me follow up with our HR person to connect the dots. Um, but that program is still um, intended to be in place, albeit it may be virtual because again, we couldn't have people in the office for safety reasons last year. Sure. So if the timing works out, we could do a face-to-face -face, uh, if the person lived close to the office that they're assigned to. Um, you know, in safe distance fashion outside or something. Um, but we're not really meeting in the office just yet. And so that's I see. a nut to crack in the equation. So 
where are you all? I know you're in San Francisco, but where, where you're across okay, the US, where are your offices? I flunked this test or not. It's not a test, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry. No, I'm just, it's okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna name a bunch and that will give you a wide uh, answer. So I'm it's a big office. First. Yes. yes. So Shanghai is the only international office we have uh, right now. Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Denver, uh, we have a bunch in the uh, the north northeast. So we have uh, Ann Arbor, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, and then we move to the east coast where we have Boston, DC, and then we go to the south where we have Dallas. And so we're missing what I call the Miss America pageant swath across the country. So we're not in the Pacific Northwest yet, and we're not in the in the Southeast. So George, we're, we're looking at those areas for expansion potential. And I know I'm probably missing an office and somebody's gonna go, but what about, oh, we do have an office, a satellite in Pittsburgh. Uh <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, well, obviously, uh, you, you are a, a very large firm, and you have offices uh, kind of all over, all over the country, and 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 one in Shanghai. Um, and so there are what what imagines in the short, in in the medium and longer term, um, you know, students will be applying and 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 be looking um, for, for 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 to see what kind of opportunities are there. Here is a question from. Yes. Uh, yeah, can you read it, Rosa? Yes, I can. Um, yeah. Do you think it's more it important for young graduating students uh, to get licensed as soon as possible or software improvement? So I think um, right off the bat, software is important. Uh, we d do tend to use Revit, but it's not a prerequisite. It is helpful if you have some Revit skills. We use Rhino. Um, there is a a plethora of software that we do use. So the more you have in your wheelhouse, the better off you are because different teams use different software to accomplish any number of tasks. Um, Enscape, I'm just gonna rattle off the ones I, I know of. We Mural is a new one. So those that are uh, digital natives tend to uh, learn those softwares faster than those that are digital tourists like myself. I, I try to be more of a native, but I'm still, Kind of in the tourist category, <laughs> um, but again, just immersion and uh, the ability to learn new software is important. And then, secondly, licensure is important in terms of advancement. You don't have to be licensed to get hired right away out of school, but working towards licensure, just getting it out of the way. I had a, a fortunate um, cohort in that when we got out of school, a lot of people believed get the license right away. So within, we had a challenge to each other as classmates to get licensed in the first three years. And it took some of us three, some of us four, but I would say a large number of our cohorts got licensed in that first five years post-graduation. And it was, I believe, a differentiator um, because it gets in the way, life gets in the way, it just gets harder and harder, confidence wanes and wefts in terms of if it's important or not, you know, all those things come up. But if you try to get it done as soon as you get out of school, it's not an issue anymore. Other things become the issue, but it's never a preventer for you. And we are working with NCARB to, again, highlight the historic issues with policies and practices that have prevented people from getting licensed, whether it's cost or the fact that they change the exam every two to three years and the rules keep changing, even though they think it's getting better. It's, you know, it was a little bit better, but now it's stagnating all over again. Um, and, and having what we, we've done at um, Smith Group is a, a, what we're calling a boot camp cohort. So people that have uh, taken the licensing exam and completed them recently, recently licensed, are paying it forward to the next group and, you know, helping them through navigate through the nuances and issues and being the cheerleaders of that group. And with Equity by Design, we're uh, creating, a, we've created a scholarship program this year to pay for three, up to three exams for the scholarship winner. So we're going to announce that next week, but we acknowledge that cost is an issue right. in inhibiting um, exams and licensure success. 
So there's a lot of factors, but yes, software and number two, license. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask because uh as i said we don't want to keep rose all night any any closing questions any observations um rosa did say that we could uh, email her or get in contact as a as a graduate of the school uh, she has made herself really available to our students before and and she is a great advisor to me and to many others and we're very thankful to to have her expertise and her voice in a lot of our conversations right now. Um, I don't know, Rosa, do you have any closing, any anything you want to say as as we as we transition off this Zoom call, probably onto another one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have said a lot, so I would love to hear, and I know it's hard to be brave to uh, speak the question that is on your mind, but if anybody does have a question or or wants to not or a non question observation that's great too yeah please please do type it in or you can unmute and just shout it out no. shout it out I, I, there's one networking uh you mentioned networking and how important that is and that's really key uh you know i've known students who have gone to meetings like aia conferences uh, receptions christmas parties and they go around shaking hands and asking questions because you're not expected to know that much, but people love to talk about themselves. So ask, you know, meet all the architects. You're fine. I had a student, he sat next to an architect at an event I invited him to. And by the end of the event, he was invited for a summer internship. So people, they like to talk about themselves and uh, it, it's hard to get over being embarrassed or, um, but go up, shake people's hands ask them questions. Uh, where is this? Where is that? Anything you can come up, come up with, get the discussion going. You know, my best student, that's what he did. He came from Rwanda. His parents were killed. He arrives here, got an undergraduate degree in architecture, got a master's in civil engineering, structural, got another master's in uh, architecture, and now he's an officer in the army and a U.S. citizen. And uh, he came with nothing. He didn't have a winter coat. He showed up in a snowstorm, knew nobody. And he went from that to uh, succeeding. And one reason why is he said, yes. I'd say, hey, you wanna go with the AIA students to the quad conference? He said, I'm there. He might be the only person that would show up to these events. Everybody else was out drinking and partying. I said, we got a field trip to New York City. I'm there. Boston, I'm there. He always went, he knows everybody. <laughs> so I just say, be outward, say yes. and. Uh, be respectful to people, but a lot of architects will give you a tour of their their office, spend a couple hours with you, which is very expensive, to show you the place and tell you about the profession if you ask. I absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And ne ne networking is obviously extremely important. Yeah. Yes, and I know you are all very social media savvy, and it's kind of scary at times, but helping for people to be able to see who you are and Again, you don't have to have it perfectly polished. Just start with a basic LinkedIn account. Get your photo up there because having the little silhouette doesn't help anybody get to know who you are. Yeah. Try to populate on a very basic level uh, what you think you're about, because and that will change over time. Update it every couple of months as you, you know, hone in who you are, and then you know people do look at that. And so when they're looking through the resume, they're also going to look at who you're connected to right? Because they're going to ask questions to vet who you are. If they're interested in your resume, they're going to want to know, is this person trustworthy? You know, can I count on this person, et cetera? The more people you're connected to uh, helps to help that vetting process happen. Yeah. And, and so it's not, you know, I'm not a LinkedIn stockholder or shareholder or anything, but with that as the major uh, professional network, it, it has become that. So not being on it is detrimental to getting yourself out there and having people um, know and start building your reputation of what you want it to be. Yes, Kristen DeWolf, uh, our <laughs> director of career services will <laughs> underscore that with many, 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 many lines for, for, for sure. Uh, it is important to, to get a LinkedIn account. Um, 
Any other closing comments, questions? We can stay a little while longer if people have things they would like to say. I know Rosa would be very happy to hear. Um, um, I have another question, actually. Please. Um, um, yeah. Hi, Rosa. Go ahead. Um, so first, I want to say thank you so much for, uh, you know, being part of something that champions, you know, diversity in hiring, because um, as a NOMAS representative, uh, we look very closely at kind of the social relations of, um, you know, like I said, like in my question, trying not to tokenize Bi BIPOC people in general. Yes. Um, so it's very refreshing to hear that that's kind of being innovated through the hiring process. Um, so as a second year in architecture, uh, in our theory class, we've been looking at kind of the self-critical nature of architects to the point that they are trying to kind of almost silence the discourse by allowing a little bit and then saying, oh, we'll do something about it and then shutting it back down in a way. Um, so I was wondering, how you see that kind of either happening or being improved upon um, in the field today? Yes, I think foundationally um, there is a uh, there's a theory called uh, the five dysfunctions and high performing teams, and uh, that was written by Robert Lencioni and oh sorry Patrick Lencioni. But essentially the core of that is a foundation of trust and psychological safety. And that's something that we try to model in terms of the difficult conversations. Um, oftentimes, I think in our culture, it's not polite to have what is deemed uh, as the taboo conversation, whether it's money, whether it's racism, whether it's talking about BIPOC, you know, Black and brown people, right? People have the, this aversion to talking about these issues. Um, when we are able to build mutual and earned respect with our with strangers that become potential peers or network or champions, and having the ability to disagree and have uh, what they call a productive or or um, productive uh, dissent or healthy conflict, you know, these words are kind of like oxymorons, right? Healthy conflict. <laughs> um, only then are we able to get to consensus, accountability and results, right? We can't actually make progress until we solve for the things that aren't working. We see that in our country today, right? So I, I implore everybody to work on, yes, there's belief systems that we don't agree with. Um, they're not of who we are. But if we shut down those conversations entirely, we're not able to bridge, to build the bridge for and create the healthy conflict and discourse that actually gets us to the fix or the results, if that makes sense. So we have to be brave to go there. I get uh, lauded by my uh, office director for the, the troublemaker in a, in a good way, <laughs> because I, I have a disposition where I can't leave the unresolved thing untouched and hidden or like, oh, let's just brush that under the rug because architects have a tendency to be conflict avoiders or uh, let's let's not go there, let's go around it, right? Um, I'm one of those, I, I can't sleep at night, I have to solve the problem, I have to fix the, the awkwardness and face it head on. So I hope more people can stretch outside of their comfort zones to be brave and vulnerable to each other. Uh, Brene Brown is a great um, growth, I think, of self-observation of that and how do we face our, sh our shame and our vulnerability. And then from that, we can actually be bridges to other people dealing with their shame and vulnerability. Because at the end of the day, we're all just afraid that people won't like us, sadly. <laughs> and that's what prevents us from actually talking to each other about these difficult conversations. So we'll Thank end you. it there. <laughs> Thank question. you. Okay. Any, uh, thank you, Sophia. A great question. Any other, any final, any final questions before we let Rosa go? It's, it, she's in California, so it's still late afternoon. She's probably got three or four Zoom calls left. Um, I, I hope this is on our coast. I hope this is everybody's last call of the day. Um, 
Rosa, I want to thank you again. What a great treat it is to see you and to chat with you and hear your insights. And um, we will um, we will be thinking about you and 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 we will call on you again because you have such great advice. We appreciate everything you've done uh, for us and for the school, and we look forward to speaking again soon. And thank you again. Thank you. Blessings. Okay. Great. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>